Yo, yo, guys, it's day two of what I'm calling Streammas. Lots of uh, YouTube channels do what's called Vlogmas, where they do a video every single day in December, vlogging their activities, etc. Um, I have decided to do Streammas, where I am doing one live stream every single day for the whole of December. Um, I probably will do one maybe like... Christmas Eve, or maybe a small one. I probably won't repair anything, might just do some like Q&A and stuff. Uh, but yes, it's day two. And if you were with us yesterday for the big, what ended up being a four hour live stream, uh, the intention was to show you guys a walkthrough of the repair of a generic 2000 watt RMS um, base mono amplifier. And you'll recognize these board designs if you have looked at cheap amplifier guts before. Um, you'll probably recognize this board layout. Now, the purpose of this live stream this evening is to carry on from last night. Uh, so last night we, we finally repaired the amplifier. It was an absolute mission. Um, and the idea of tonight's live stream is to show you a modification which needs to be done to these amplifiers. This amplifier in specific, in particular, is a base phase DB 1.3. It uses the same basic circuit layout as many, like hundreds of amplifiers coming out of China. Um, you cheat, you're generally a pretty cheap stuff. They kind of make about rated power depending on how the manufacturer rates them. Uh, this thing will do about 2000 watts. It's rated for 2500 watts. Um, however, there is a significant design flaw with this amplifier and the purpose of the live stream this evening is to go over that and for me to show you what circuit modifications to add uh, to fix the problem and to make the amplifier behave much better. Evening guys, good evening, good evening to all of you. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait for a few more people to jump on the stream because I'm going to be doing some um, kind of lesson via Microsoft Paint uh, to explain exactly what the modification is that I'm going to be doing and uh, then how to do it. So to explain to you at first the problem with the these amplifiers, I'm going to show you the amplifier's power-up procedure. Um, now I am using a current limited power supply, so I'm just going to get the amplifier powered up first initially, just to kind of charge the rail capacitors here. Um, and then from how the amplifier turns on, you will see the problem. Okay. So let's give you the scope screen here. The amplifier is currently powered up and I am probing the back of the power supply MOSFET. So the power supply MOSFETs are obviously driving the transformers and so they will have a on-off push-pull square wave that's driving the AC on the transformers which is then changing into high voltage. So here you can see the uh, the square wave we have 50% of the time the uh, MOSFET is turned on and 50% of the time the MOSFET is turned off this is what's referred to as dead time the dead time being this the time that the MOSFET is dead or off is the dead time and the duty cycle is the percentage of time that the MOSFET is turned on so when you see a uh, duty cycle as 50% duty cycle. That's what this is. So this is what I'd call kind of like full duty. This this is basically when uh, the MOSFETs are turning on and off at full duty cycle. Um, the push bank is on fully for 50% of the time, and then it instantly switches to the the uh, pull bank, which is on for the other 50% of the time. And you can see that if I grab my other scope probe and we probe the uh, the other bank. Here, let's go over here and probe one of these bad boys. And probe here. So you can see here, if I separate these slightly, let's get that one down there, looks a bit nicer. So here we have what I would call the uh, the push bank and the pull bank. So while this, this is off, so while the push bank is on, the pull bank is off, and as soon as the uh, push bank turns off, 
the polar bank turns on. So that's what I call 50% duty cycle. Um, and the dead time being the time that each one is off. Now, if you have done amplifier repair in the past um, and you have watched an amplifier start up or power up on the oscilloscope while you're probing the uh, power supply MOSFETs, you'll notice the way that it turns on, it kind of, the square wave doesn't just instantly appear, it kind of smoothly rolls out. It starts at nothing, 0% duty cycle, and it slowly rolls out and gets to halfway and then stops, or the drive wave will, or the, the, the power supply MOSFET, the wave on the back of the MOSFET, won't instantly be a perfect square wave. If you probe the gate signal, it will roll out into 50% duty cycle as the amplifier softly and slowly powers up. However, that is not the case with these amplifiers. Let's just, uh, let's get the amplifier powered up again here. So let me just turn it off. So as soon as the amplifier comes into operation, bam, the square waves are instantly there. There's no kind of um, like variation of duty cycle. There's no soft ramping of duty cycle for the power supply MOSFETs on the gates. It's just instantly, bam, 50% duty cycle. Off, on again. Bam, instantly 50% duty cycle. Now, you might not think that's a problem, but the issue with this is that this amplifier has pull down, resist has pull down resistors on the rail capacitors. So when the, power when the amplifier turns on, Essentially, these power supply MOSFETs are charging the rail capacitors through the transformer. So high voltage will be stored in these capacitors. Now, when the amplifier is turned off and left for more than, say, five minutes, these capacitors will be drained empty by the pull down resistors. That prevents any high voltage being left in the board for years uh, without those resistors. Those capacitors will just hold on to their current for a long time. So they need pull down resistors to safely discharge all the electricity from the board when it's not in use. So that means that every single time this amplifier powers up from from cold operation, from like cold, standing cold, it hasn't been powered up for over five minutes, every single time it turns on, these power supply, these power supply MOSFETs have to charge eight rail capacitors. And what you'll know about a capacitor is that when it's empty, it actually presents a dead short circuit to the rest of a circuit that's powering it. If you take your multimeter and you read the resistance across a capacitor that's empty, initially it'll start off at zero ohms or like a dead short and then gradually your multimeter will charge the capacitor because the multimeter is, is supplying current in order to read resistance. It'll charge the capacitor so then the resistance will rise. Now the capacitor is only a dead short for a tiny fraction of a second. The moment it gets current into the capacitor the, the resistance absolutely skyrockets into finally becoming um, like infinite, infinitely resistive uh, when the capacitor is fully charged. But having eight rail capacitors that are absolutely empty and presenting a dead short to the power supply MOSFETs, for the power supply MOSFETs to instantly turn on, bam, that is extremely taxing and very, very stressful for the power supply section. Every single time it turns on, bam, it's trying to drive a short circuit for a fraction of a second. It is a big current spike. If you try and power up one of these amplifiers on a test bench um, or on a limited current supply uh, power supply, you'll notice that when it powers on, it really struggles. It like clicks and glitches and glitches and the power supply will trip out and try again, trip out, try again, trip out, try again. That's what you hear. When you hear my power supply here, look, let's let's probe the 12 volts coming from the power supply, okay? So let's get, let's get rid of that one. Uh, let's probe the 12 volts coming from my power supply. Uh, let's just get that back down zeroed. So let's, let's go to 12 volts here, and I'm going to go really, really slow on the scope screen, so you can kind of see the dips. Really, really slow on the scope screen, so you can kind of see the dips happening, okay? So I'm going to try and power the amplifier up, and I'm only going to allow uh, 0.5 amps of current into the amplifier. So 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, so with a really low current. And you'll see here that the amplifier spikes. It tries to draw current instantly, and the voltage will drop as a result. See this? So those great big sort of spikes downward are the the power supply uh, MOSFETs drawing immense current spike at an instant in order to try and charge these rail capacitors that are almost empty. So what we need to do, of course, 
is we need to modify this circuit so that it's like every other car amplifier on the market and slowly increases dead time on the power supply MOSFETs to slowly charge those capacitors and not put such a strain, an instantaneous kind of spike on the power supply MOSFETs. So let's, let's see, is there enough people here for me to start explaining how to do that? 68, yeah, that'll do. 68 people. Greetings from uh, New Mexico. How's it going? Montana? What's up, buddy? What's up, yo? So yeah, this is this, this is the problem with the amplifier, and uh, we're going to tell you guys how to fix it. So, the reason that it powers up like this is all down to how the circuit around the TL494 is designed. So if I give you the picture of a TL494 here, let's maximize this. Now you should be looking at my screen here. Here we go. So this is the TL494. So the TL494 chip is what's generating those pulses that drive the power supply MOSFETs. So, so this chip completely controls how the power supply acts. Okay. Now the pins that we're interested in here in terms of getting this amplifier to power up slowly and controlled rather than just going full duty cycle straight away is this pin here. Number four. Pin number four, DTC, stands for Dead Time Control. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to quickly add a, uh, a camera here on here so you can kind of see my face. Uh, add display cap, no, not display capture. Add a video, video capture device. And I think I need uh, side, side Logi. There we go. Side Logitech. Let's get my face up in here. And then I think I can hold Alt and, and get rid of, yeah, there we go. There we go. Just, just going to grab my face up top here. All right, cool. So pin number four is called, stands for dead time control. Remember what I said earlier? Dead time. Dead time is the amount of time that the, uh, the, the PWM signal is off. And the duty cycle is the percentage of time that the drive PWM is on. So dead time control will control the amount of dead time that the output PWM has on it. Now, the way that this works, pin number four, is that when pin number four is high, let's just uh, do this on the side here, put this down, so pin number four, when, when pin number four has, for example, five volts on it, let's get this black, Come on, why are you going black, go black, there we go, five volts versus zero volts. So when pin number five, well, sorry, when pin four has five volts on it, there is 100% dead time, which means that basically there's no output from pins 9 and 10. Pins 9 and 10 are the pins which the PWM emits from. So here you go, pins 9 and 10 is where the PWM comes out of. Let's see if I can just draw a little, a little wave there. Like that. And then we want to go up and down, up, down. They're out of phase of each other because we're in uh, push-pull orientation. So pin 9 and 10 has these PWM waves on it. However, when the voltage on pin number 4 is all the way up at 5 volts up here, the dead time is at 100%, which means that we get absolutely no output on pins 9 and 10. It's just a straight line. Okay? Burp. That's not quite a straight line, but yeah, it should be a straight line. Um, now, as the voltage on pin 5 drops... So now let's say it's at four volts here. This is the four volt mark. When the voltage on pin four gets to four volts, there is a bit of dead time. Uh, sorry, 100% uh, dead time. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit less dead time and a bit more duty cycle. So when the voltage on pin number four, dead time control, is at four volts, you'll get something that looks a bit like this coming out of pins nine and 10. Get ground there and then you'll get, oops, I need to change it to my pencil. Let's just go a little bit bigger. You'll get more, something more like this. A lot of dead time, a little pulse, a lot of dead time. And then the opposite on here. Uh, you'll get a little, little negative pulse there. Like so. Now as the voltage comes down even further to like 2.5 volts, you get even less dead time and more duty cycle, which means that you end up with a wave that looks like this. 
a bit more there and then a bit more dead time so it's, it's gradually growing in size as the, uh, the dead time reduces and then finally when you get all the way down to zero volts when you've got zero volts or when you ground pin number four if pin number four is at zero volts or grounded you will get absolute equal amount of dead time and on time from the output on pins 9 and 10 which means that it's at full duty cycle in terms of push-pull operation here so the issue with how this amplifier has been designed is that pin number four is actually tied to ground which is freaking stupid so this amplifier is designed with pin number four tied to ground it's, it's literally soldered to ground. So pin 4 can never be anything more than zero, 0 volts. So therefore the dead time can never be, or the, so the duty cycle can never be any less than 50%. So that means that this chip is either active, 100% active, or off. It can't be anywhere in between. It can't slowly soft start the power supply MOSFETs to slowly charge these rail capacitors because it is tied to ground. And the way that the amplifier turns on, if we view how this amplifier comes on with this camera here. So you see the, the LEDs here. Just to take, take a note of the LEDs and you'll see it go from uh, off to on. Let's probe the uh, power supply effects here. So you see when the amplifier first starts up. Oh, crap. When the amplifier first starts up, it's in protection. It's in like kind of red mode, which means that it's not active yet. And then... When the amplifier, let's just get it powered up for a sec, and then power down and power back up again. You see the strain on the power supply, right? So we, we, now we turn it off. When we turn it on, it's, it's off to start with, and then it goes boom, on instantly. So when the light turns from red to blue, the same circuit that's kind of turning the light from red to blue is the same circuit that is dropping voltage on pin three here. from 5 volts to 0 volts. So the power up procedure of this amplifier is literally just voltage on pin 3 is at 5 volts when the amplifier is not powered up yet. It's in the red mode before it kind of starts to turn on. And then when the amplifier then goes into operation mode and turns on, it instantly drops, bam, straight to 0 volts on pin 3, which instantly turns on the chip and at full duty cycle. So that's why the amplifier powers up in such a stressful way that it does. Let me show you that on the scope here. What I'm going to do is take my oscilloscope probe here. I'm going to probe pin number three of the TL494. Okay, so with pin number three of the TL494 uh, probed here, you can see that when I turn the amplifier on, hopefully we can see this. So the amplifier, I'm just going to turn it on now. You can see it's high, which is disabling the amplifier from coming on. So the red light is on. And then when the amplifier tries to power up, it goes down to ground. So on procedure, it's in re red mode. And now it goes bang on. The, the voltage on pin 3 drops from 5 volts. I think it's 5 volts. Four, yeah, about 4.25 volts. Drops from 5 volts to ground instantly, which turns the amplifier on. And the voltage on pin number 4, which is the dead time control, which should be, in an ideal world, slowly falling down rather than just being ground, it doesn't move because it is it is ground. You see, it, this just ground all the time. So the way that we fix this then is we need to, we can leave pin three alone. So the way that this amplifier is turning on is pin three goes from five volts to zero volts. And then the amplifier, this, this starts oscillating, starts outputting PWM. Um, I can't be asked to draw a square wave. And then it comes to life. So what we need to do in order to provide this amplifier with a soft start is we need to break the ground. We need to break the ground connection on pin number four. So we need to get rid of that so that pin number four is no longer grounded. Then what we need to do is somehow feed pin four with a gradually, gradually dropping voltage from five volts to zero volts. So that when the amplifier goes active and pin 3 goes from 5 to 0, pin 4 also goes from 5 to 0, but slowly. So it like slowly go, slowly falls from 5 volts, slowly, slowly to 0 volts. And all the while that it's falling, 
the duty cycle or the dead time will be slowly changing from like um, from a very very short pulse like this slowly changing to a slightly wider pulse to a slightly wider pulse until it's a 50% duty cycle and the amplifier is then in full operation with full current supply to the output section. So how do we do that of course? Well the way that we are going to do this is with a capacitor and a few other components. So if we want voltage to slowly fall from 5 volts to 0 volts, uh, an easy way to do that is to have a capacitor be charged at 5 volts and then have the capacitor discharge to ground through a high value resistor. So if you place a capacitor and you place a, a 100 kilo ohm resistor across it, then the five volts will slowly drain to ground and you'll have five, four, three, two, one until the capacitor is empty. And that's exactly what we want. We want pin number four to listen to that voltage. And that's important to know. So the way that we're gonna set this up is like this. I'm gonna draw the little circuit diagram now to explain how this is gonna work. You should see my screen now. Yep, yeah, cool. Uh, can I just kind of zoom in halfway? Uh, don't seem to be able to zoom in halfway. Okay, never mind. So let's get rid of this ground there. Get rid of the ground. So on pin number three, we have a supply of five volts to start with, and then it goes to ground. So let's draw that in first. So in phase one, we have five volts coming in here. Five and then it eventually goes to ground when the amplifier turns on. So let's take let's take the, the pre-startup phase to begin with. The second that you apply the remote to the amplifier, five volts is sent to pin three to put the amplifier into disable mode, into shutdown mode, and then when it's ready to turn on, it goes to zero volts. So here's five volts, and here is our dead time control that also needs to start at five volts. So. We already know that we need a capacitor in there somewhere. So let's take our capacitor, which is going to be this. Now we are going to use a 10 microfarad capacitor for this. It's a good value. It's just one I had laying around, which is why it's a great value to use. <laughs> so we can use a 10 microfarad capacitor here. And this is the capacitor that is going to be charged with 5 volts and is then going to discharge to ground, which is going to give our pin 4 the slowly dropping voltage from 5 volts to 0 volts to slowly turn the amplifier on. So we need to wire this up. Let's take our wire and let's put here. We're going to ground this. Burp, burp, burp. Looks like a really poor Wi-Fi signal. And the positive of this, we are going to connect to... dead time control over here and we're also going to connect it to our 5 volts feedback but not directly so we need to charge this capacitor well, obviously this capacitor is going to be empty so we already know that we need to drain this capacitor of its energy in order to uh, pull that voltage down to ground slowly so let's take a resistor and let's place a resistor across the capacitor and this resistor value is going to be 100 kilo ohms, a nice high value resistor that's going to slowly discharge this capacitor. 100k. So now this resistor is always slowly discharging this capacitor when it has voltage in it. But at the moment, it's not got any voltage in it because we haven't connected it to any source of, of voltage or anything like that. Um, so we need to get voltage into this capacitor first before it can be discharged. Now, fortunately, we have a nice supply of 5 volts here before the amplifier turns on. So what we can do is we can use that supply of 5 volts and um, we can use that to charge the capacitor. But the problem is if we just connect this straight to here, then when, the, when this goes to zero volts, when this changes into a zero volts, then this capacitor is also going to drain back down into pin three and it's going to prevent the amplifier from powering up straight away, which is not what we want. We want pin three to go straight to ground so that we have instant operation and then slowly turning on due to the, the, the falling voltage on pin four. So we can't just connect it straight away. We need to connect a diode in series between pin three and pin four here for the capacitor. 
So let's take our diode because we want to block any voltage coming back the other way from the capacitor into pin 3. So let's take that here. Uh, I might need to flip this around. So we need to block volt uh, the current coming back from the capacitor. So let's rotate this uh, 90 degrees, make it a little bit smaller. Okay, so here we go. Let's connect that up to our 5 volts line from pin 3 so that it can charge the capacitor through the, di through the diode. And then when this goes to 0 volts, the capacitor will drain through this resistor only and it won't try and drain back through other parts of the circuit and cause the amplifier not to turn on because of this diode blocking the way. So then the voltage will drain through the capacitor and this pin 4 will be listening to the voltage drop. Remember, the voltage from the capacitor isn't able to drain through pin 4. Pin 4 is just like an ear. It's just like a listener. It's listening, it's, it's, it's looking for voltage and depending on what the voltage is, it depends on how it acts. So it's listening to the voltage at the capacitor as it drains to ground as a result of this 100k resistor. However, I noticed that there was a problem with this circuit. The problem with this circuit is that when you first apply the remote to the amplifier, this 5 volts that gets sent to pin 3, this needs to be instantaneously sent to pin 3 before anything else happens. Otherwise, the amplifier will try to power up while this is at 0 volts. Now, if you connect the, capaci the pa capacitor directly to pin 3 through the, through the diode, then the capacitor, like we mentioned earlier, actually presents this pin 3 or this 5 volt um, signal into pin 3 with a direct short circuit for a brief fraction of a second until the capacitor is charged. Remember the capacitors when they're empty present a low resistance to a circuit until they're charged when they present a high resistance. So when this capacitor is empty it will present a sh kind of short circuit to the 5 volt uh, signal line. So what actually ends up happening is when you try and turn the amplifier on, there's a tiny fraction of a second where the chip activates because this isn't 5 volts because it's shorted to try and charge the cap quickly. So there's a brief fraction of a second where it's actually too low. It's like down at 0.5 volts for a fraction of a second. So the chip activates and we get PWM on 9 and 10 at full duty cycle for a brief fraction of a second until the capacitor is charged enough that 5 volts is able to be on pin 3 uh, which disables the chip. So that means that when you apply the remote you get like a tiny click where the power supply activates for a brief second and then shuts off when 5 volts finally gets its way onto pin 3. And obviously that's not ideal. We want this to be completely asleep until it's ready to turn on. We don't want any little pulses of, of power coming into the amplifier before it's ready for it. So the way that we do that is we slow down, we add resistance to the capacitor charging circuit. So we don't let the capacitor have full current from this little 5 volt signal rail um, signal we here. We, we, we give it uh, uh, some resistance so that this 5 volts is easily able to uh, give 5 volts to pin 3 and it's not pulled down by trying to charge this capacitor very quickly. We don't need the capacitor to charge very fast. It can charge quite slowly because what all the time that that 5 volts is on pin 3, the amplifier is disabled. So we don't need the capacitor to charge particularly fast. It can charge you know, a little bit slower. It doesn't matter. As long as the capacitor is fully charged by the time the amplifier tries to activate, that then everything will work as planned. So we take a second resistor here and we place that in series with the 5 volt line coming from the um, coming from the, the signal there to, to turn the amplifier on and off. So let's draw that in. And this resistor is going to be a 10k which I, I, I find works well. A 10k resistor here works perfectly for limiting the current uh, of charging the capacitor enough that the amplifier doesn't glitch as it turns on, uh, but it's low enough to charge the capacitor quickly enough so that the capacitor is fully charged by the time that the amplifier tries to turn on. Is everybody following so far? Let's check some live chat. Wow, guys, thank you very much for the donations. Uh, Matthew Macy, dude, cheers uh, for the five on day two. I noticed this, you dropped some uh, dropped some coins uh, yesterday, so thank you very much for the five. Massive, massive appreciations. Um, Jerry Jim, thank you very much for the five. Massively appreciated as well. If you've got any questions, not sure if you have, let me know. 
So guys, do you have any questions about that circuit I've just showed you? I, I understand that it, it might be a little bit complicated if you've not done circuit design before, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the amplifier to turn on slowly. Um, so if you've got any questions about what I've just gone through, let me know. And uh, when we're ready, I will install this modification to the amplifier and show you it working in person and show you the benefit of having that circuit in place. Is this, uh, let's have a quick look. Here we go. So, uh, resistor capacitor. I can't see the drawing. Okay. Is this why some amps start in protect mode? So most of the time when you, when you first apply, like most amplifiers, when you first apply the remote, it won't turn on instantaneously. Um, some amplifiers do, JBL amplifiers, the JBL 14001, the second you apply the remote, boop, the uh, dead time goes whoop, and it turns on instantly. Um, but some amplifiers will start off in a protection mode purely so that if you, you know, because sometimes you accidentally turn your stereo on and you're like, oh no shit, and you turn it off. Or sometimes you might, you know, you don't want the amplifier to power up the second that, that the remote signal is applied. I, I don't think. I think there should be a two to three second delay between when you apply the remote to when the amplifier tries to power up. Now, some people might assume that while the amplifier is in this kind of pre-powered protection mode or whatever, it's doing a health check. And for 99% of amplifiers, that is not the case, um, even though it might look like it. The only amplifiers, there are some amplifiers that go through a health check mode before they turn on fully. And those are the Brazilian amplifiers. And this is why I have a big respect for uh, Brazilian amplifiers, the new stuff that they're bringing out. Taramps, Stetson, Banda, Sound Digital, etc. All of those amplifiers, when you first apply the remote, the power supply will just send a couple of tiny, tiny pulses to the output section, which builds like a few volts of rail voltage. And by doing this, the amplifier can check the health status of the output section. It can make sure that there's no DC offset on the speaker terminals. It can make sure that it's building enough rail voltage based on the pulses that it gave. And if it doesn't, if there's not enough rail voltage being built, then hey, there must be a short circuit somewhere. It can also check that there is decent drive going to the MOSFETs before the rail voltage like fully goes high voltage. So the Brazilian amplifiers go into a health check mode before they power up, which is why when you turn on a Brazilian amplifier, you see the lights go blue, orange, red, Blue. The, the, the time when it's going blue, orange, red like a traffic light is doing the health check mode, which is fucking awesome. Uh, but no, these amplifiers don't have anything like that. My Honda, cheers for the 20, bud. Back in here late, I know, what I missed so far. Um, so, so far I've explained a modification circuit that I'm going to do for this amplifier to improve its turn on reliability. This amplifier has a flaw in the way it turns on. Uh, and I've explained so far in a kind of very sketchy Microsoft Paint kind of schematic form what I'm going to be doing and explained why I'm going to be doing it like that. Um, let's give you this camera back again. Soft turn on and off line is based on feedback resistor to prevent cap from quickly trying to charge. So what's your preferred amount of time you tend to like? What for the soft start to turn on? Um, so it depends. The, you can change the time which the amplifier takes to go full duty cycle by changing the value of the capacitor that is storing the energy and by changing the value of the resistor across the capacitor. A lower value resistor will obviously cause the amplifier to power up quicker uh, and a lower value capacitor will cause it to turn on quicker as well. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So now that we've explained it in theory, let's show it in practice. Ooh, crap. Let's turn the power supply off. And let's show you exactly what that circuit looks like in, in person. So this is the circuit that we are adding to this amplifier. And here's one that I made earlier. It's kind of janky. It's just like a bunch of components soldered together. Uh, it looks like, uh, looks like this. So, Based on the circuit diagram then, where's my tweezers? Here's the capacitor that's going to be storing the 5 volts coming from the uh, pin 3 line. So that the amplifier provides 5 volts to pin 3 at first to be in disable mode. And that's going to charge this capacitor. And it's going to charge this capacitor through two components. Crap, this is much harder to hold than it looks. So here we have the diode. 
This is the diode that's connecting to the 5 volt uh, signal coming from pin 3 of the TL494. So that is going to, the, the 5 volt signal is going to go through the diode. It's going to be able to pass because we've got it in this orientation. It's then going to go through this 10k resistor, which is going to be limiting the current drawn from the 5 volt line. So it doesn't charge the capacitor too quickly, uh, which will drop voltage across the 5 volt line, which we don't want. Then we have a 100 kilo ohm resistor, which is soldered across the capacitor, which drains it slowly when the 5 volts disappears from the diode. So that is all we need to add a soft start circuit to this amplifier. So let's see exactly where it fits in the board and see how it changes operation. For those of you that have just joined, I'm going to turn the amplifier on one last time so you can see why we're doing this and what it looks like before and what it looked like after. So let's just take my scope screen here. Uh, let's just power the amplifier up first to get it all powered up. Okay, so at the moment, without the modification, this is how the amplifier powers up. Boom. Instant, straight away, 50% duty cycle, which is very stressful on the uh, power supply MOSFETs when the capacitors are empty. It might make more sense, actually, here if I show you this is the gate drive. So this is the um, PWM signal on the gates of the power supply MOSFETs. When we turn the amplifier on, like so, boom, instant, straight away, full duty cycle, 50% dead time, um, which, is, which is very stressful. So this is what we don't want to see. We want to see that be a nice smooth line, uh, a nice smoothing increment of uh, duty cycle as the amplifier fires up. So that's what it was before. And now let's add our little circuit that we've just made, add our little, a little set of components and see how it changes the behavior of that power up. Um, burp, 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 burp. Just need to shifty shifty it over here. We need to look at uh, this circuit here. Shift my camera over slightly. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So here is the. Uh, oh, this wire is very much in the way. So here is the TL494 chip, here. So it's kind of blocked from your view by this capacitor, which is kind of annoying. So let's just see if I can shift that over. So yeah, the TL494 chip is here. So here we have pins one, two, three, and four. So the only pins that we were interested in at the moment is pin three and four. So pin three is gonna be what's supplying our five volts um, for charging this little capacitor on here. And pin number four is what we need to connect the positive end of this capacitor to so that the, uh, it can listen to the voltage slowly draining from the capacitor. So just to make things easier, I'm going to remove the TL494 first um, because we need to get rid of the ground connection on pin four. So the way that this amplifier is designed is pin four is actually grounded. So pin four, which is dead time control, is currently tied to ground so that it can never have any positive voltage on it. So what we need to do is actually take a Stanley knife blade and cut the trace to remove the ground connection on pin number four. So let's remove the TL494 first. So it's a little bit easier to work on around here. There we go. TL494 chip is out of the board. So now what we need to do is we need to take a Stanley knife blade, which I should have on the table here, and we need to break the connection of pin number four to ground. Now pin number four which is just here. This has a little trace that goes whoop de doop de doop round here to this capacitor here. Now this capacitor is ground on this side. So there's a little trace just along here that goes to ground on this capacitor. So what we need to do is we need to cut that trace, which is actually gonna be a little tricky getting in there to cut that trace nice and cleanly. 
so that pin 4 no longer is tied to ground. One, two, three, four. There we go. Just doing a little snippity snip. There we go. Let's just see whether that cu that cut has worked. There's a tiny little cut there. It's very hard to see on the camera, probably. So let's see whether it's still grounded. Uh, nope, it doesn't seem to be grounded anymore. So there's ground on the capacitor. Um, pin number four no longer has ground on it. Yeah, so I just cut that trace. So now pin number four no longer is grounded. Perfect. That's what we want. I'm just going to try and pull the um, pull the trace away a little bit so that it's not super close so it doesn't like latch on again just got to kind of lift the trace up a little bit just to completely remove it from that ground trace entirely there we go I'm happy with that so that's all we need to do on this section here uh, next we need to find a source of um, the 5 volts on pin 3. So pin 3 here, we can solder a wire directly to pin 3, but that's a little bit fiddly. So alternatively, we can find out, is there anywhere else that has continuity to pin 3? It's a little bit easier, a little bit easier location to uh, solder a wire to. And as luck would have it, pin 3 is connected to a resistor all the way over here. There's a resistor just behind this bloody capacitor. Oh, this camera angle is so tricky because this capacitor is all in the way. Actually, maybe I'll use this, this camera. Here we go. Maybe I'll use this camera just so it's at the side so you can see what I'm doing. So pin number three, which is the five volts that we want to tap into, has continuity to a resistor over here. So we need to connect this to the capacitor positive through the diode and resistor. And then we need to connect pin 4 to the capacitor positive after the diode and resistor. And then we need a ground for the capacitor. And there's a very handy ground point here. See, this has got a little hole in it. This is a via for this capacitor to go to, go to ground. So what we can do is we can use this little hole as a place to stick our circuit in. So here is the capacitor. All we need to do is to shove the capacitor negative into that via like so and then we can solder that from the bottom of the board and that will stay in place so we have the ground for the capacitor let's solder that in place real quick There's the little there's the little ground point that we're soldering to. Just under here. There we go, excellent stuff. So that capacitor should now be soldered into the ground. There we go. So the next thing then that we need to do is we need to connect up this diode to the five volt supply of the TL494. And we noticed that there was a handy little uh, resistor over here that just happens to have the 5 volt supply on it as well. So let's 
go and take that from over there. Let's get you a better view. Let's bend this round so we can see what we're doing a bit better. There we go. That's better, isn't it? You can see that a little bit easier now. So yeah, there's a resistor just here that has the five volts ready for this diode. So let's take a little piece of wire and let's solder that. Just gonna strip a tiny bit of wire here. Elliot, Elliot Vieres, thank you very much for the, uh, the 10, buddy. You say you don't like using power tool for screws. Why not use the adjustable drill clutch? Um, yeah, so even then, you still can't really get a feel for it and you don't really feel how tightly it's done up. I have um, I have rounded off either, obviously the rounded off screws or I've pulled out um, pulled out threads even with it on like the lowest setting. So I, I, I like to be able to feel the amount of torque that I'm putting in like with my hand when I'm doing up screws and stuff. Let's get a little bit of wire here and connect this up to the five volts. That's this resistor here. Actually, I think there's a little via right next to that resistor. I might be able to poke my wire down through, which is awesome if I if I can. Yeah, look at that. Awesome. Pro level. Not really. This is janky as fuck. <laughs> okay, it just needs to be about that long. Let's snip it off there. Now, I'm actually going to be quite lazy. I'm going to strip strip the rest of this wire with my uh, soldering iron. <laughs> Just going to melt the plastic away. Use some solder to do so. Because this wire is very, very, very fragile. So I don't want to pull it because I've got it just the right length. Yeah, man. There we go. Now it's melted. I should just be able to pull the rest of that off. There we go. There we go. Tin the end of that. And we're going to connect that to our diode. Because that is the 5 volt supply to charge the capacitor. Our diode is just here, as you can see. There we go, lovely jubbly. So now this capacitor is going to charge up it when the 5 volt is supplied to the TL494's pin 3. And then when the 5 volts is disappeared from the uh, pin 3 supply, it's going to discharge to ground through the, um, through the 10k resistor. So now, in order for the amplifier to soft start, we need to connect a piece of wire to directly to the capacitor's positive terminal, not through the resistor, directly through the capacitor's positive terminal, so that would be exactly here, this point here, we need to connect that to pin 4 of the TL494. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solder back in the TL494 so that we can um, solder a small piece of wire to pin number 4. A little bit of flux.
There we go. I'm just going to quickly check that I didn't reconnect. So obviously with all that flux and solder, it's possible that the little break that I made to pin 4 has uh, grabbed some of that solder and reconnected it to ground. Nope. Doesn't look like we have connected to, uh, pin 4 to ground. Yep, the little break in the circuit is still there. And there's pin 4. So what we're going to do now is take a little piece of wire, strip the end off, solder it to pin 4, and then run it round to the capacitor positive. Get some fresh solder on pin four there. Now let's tin our piece of wire. The effect of this mod is so satisfying when it's finished. By the way, it's it's, it's so nice to see it like the mod the mod work. It's really cool. I've got the wrong I've got the wrong soldering iron tip for this job really. But we're just going to roll with it. There we go. I do believe that is connected. So we just need to run it round. All the way over to our little janky mod circuit over the other side of the board. Now we need to connect that directly to the capacitor positive, which is just there. So let's see if I can route, route this a little nicer through here. There we go. So we need about that much length. Let's chop it off here. soldering directly to the positive on that capacitor. There we go. So that's what our little, little mod looks like. These wires are so annoying, they get right in the way. So literally, that's all it is. All the mod is, is just a capacitor, two resistors, a diode, and some wires to uh, attach it to the correct pins on the TL494. And that should allow the amplifier to soft start when it powers up. Do you want to see if it worked? I've done this a couple of times, or I've done this a few times already, but it's been a few weeks since I did it, so I can't remember. If I missed anything, but I'm pretty sure that's it. Ah, oh, thanks to Joel H for the 549. Cheers, thank you. Massive appreciation for that. What would be the what would be a possible power increase if you try to upgrade the FETs in a head unit? As most of them do not have more than 25 watts RMS per channel. So head units don't use MOSFETs per se. Inside a head unit, you have a uh, a chip that is uh, that is a whole amplifier module integrated into the chip. So the only way to ask a head unit to do more power is you'd have to replace the chip or provide the uh, chip with a higher voltage to start with. From memory, 
head units, they use the 12 volts or 14 volts from the, uh, the power supply directly to drive the speaker. So they don't create any higher voltage rail voltages or anything like that. So the, the amount of power that you can have uh, to car speakers is limited by the maximum amplitude of 14 volts. So uh, head units will always be full bridge um, and that way you can get double the power from just having uh, 12 or 14 volt rails. Full bridge amplifiers require half the rail voltage of a half bridge amplifier. So head units will always be full bridge and um, they'll be single ended full bridge uh, little amplifiers. And that's how you get, uh, what is it? Yeah, you, uh, peak to peak, 14 volts peak to peak. Uh, I think it's like seven or something watt RMS uh, per side, which is then doubled to about 14 volts RMS or something into a four ohm load is about 25 watts or something. So um, yeah. Okay, let's see whether this modification has worked then. It's all wired up, all ready to go. Let's see what happens. So just like before, we're going to probe the. Uh, just like before, we're going to probe the back of the. No, not we're going to. Just like before, we're going to probe the gate of the power supply MOSFET, and hopefully we should see the dead time slowly rise instead of just jumping straight to full duty cycle. Are you ready? Um, uh, this is not a custom ramp, by the way. Well, it is a custom ramp, but this one's been written off. Uh, so this amplifier is now completely... I've repaired it, but it's... You know, the, the guy isn't having it back, I, I don't think. There's this board. So I'm purely just doing this to show you. This is not... I'm not doing this for any of my benefits, just to show you guys. Um, yeah. Okay, three, two, one. So amplifier is in red mode, and now as it comes on... We should see. Yep, let's just get some let's just get some voltage in the capacitors first, because I've got there we go. There we go. Okay. So that's exactly what we want to see. Let's start it again from off. So power's off. Now the amplifier's turning on, and you see the dead time slowly, slowly increasing to 50%. That, my friends, is a successful soft start modification. It makes such a difference to how these amplifiers power up, honestly. It is a complete game changer and it will massively improve the reliability of the power supply sections in these amplifiers. Let's give you both of those. Let's give you uh, the push and pull so you can see. Uh, I think if I remember rightly, push and pull is over here maybe. Uh, five volts, go up here. Oh, no, that's uh, maybe maybe one of these ones over here is the push and the pull. There we go. Yep, so that's the push and pull. Slowly, slowly increasing in dead time to 50% duty cycle. Slowly powering up the amplifier. Rather than it just being, boom, instantly straight on, drawing loads of current, spiking current on the power supply MOSFETs, damaging, damaging them slowly over time. Now we have a nice slow startup, which is absolutely perfect for the amplifier. Now let's have a quick look. What does that look like on the back of the MOSFET? So what we were probing there was the MOSFET gate. Um, so that, that's what the uh, drive circuit is giving to the MOSFET to power up. Well, if we actually probe the back of the power supply MOSFET, you'll see that the wave shape instead looks like this. You see that? It kind of, you get a square wave with like a big spike dip down the middle. And that's how, that's how low dead time translates. There we go. I've just paused the scope there halfway through the amplifier's power up procedure. So you can see here that when you have a, a, a low amount of dead time, um, sorry, a high amount of dead time and a low amount of duty cycle, when you have a small little pulse, a small little pulse on the gate of the MOSFET, then this is what it equates to on the back of the MOSFET. You get this kind of, the, the square wave would be like this, but then it has this big dip and comes up. Now this is totally normal, and you will actually see this. You will see this exact wave on a lot of car amplifiers as it's powering up, and you'll see it especially on amplifiers with a regulated power supply. 
amplifiers with a regulated power supply, what they do is they will reduce the duty cycle from 50% to a much lower duty cycle when the amplifier is not under a huge load. So when the amplifier is just idling or playing at low volume, the power supply won't be at full duty cycle. It'll be at like 10, 20, 30% duty cycle. And the power supply uh, MOSFET wave will actually look a bit like this. And when you when you first see this, and if you haven't seen it before and understand what it is, you might think that that's a problem. You might be looking at that wave and thinking, "Oh hell, that's not right. That looks terrible. That's a that's a janky looking wave." You know, you're used to you're used to wanting to see like nice clean square waves. So when you see that from a regulated power supply, a lot of techs are like, "What the hell is this? Like that looks really bad." And maybe even start trying to repair it when there's nothing wrong with it. But if you see a power supply wave that looks like that. It's just that there's low dead time on the gate and it's probably regulated power supply. And um, the power supply drive waves, uh, sorry, the power supply MOSFET output waves look like that when the amplifier is turning on, going from uh, low duty cycle to full duty cycle, and then you'll, you'll eventually get a square wave that looks like that. Now, what does that look like on the, uh, on the, mod, on the mod circuit that we've made? Let's go over here. So remember, Pin number four of the TL494 needs to have voltage that sinks down on it. So let's apply the remote, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to probe, essentially, what we're sending to pin four of the TL494. Amplifier comes on. Uh, let's just give that a bit more voltage. So amplifier turns on. Voltage rises to about 3.4. And then as the amplifier powers up... Oops, I'm not giving you the scope screen, sorry. So yeah, amplifier powers up. We get voltage on pin three, which is also on pin four. And then slowly, slowly sinks down there we go power amplifier on and it's turning on amp the uh, voltage on that slowly sinks down it goes through the capacitor to ground and pin four listens to that and uh yeah that's that's essentially how that works what i might actually do i've actually just noticed there is quite a voltage difference between I think this amplifier has a weaker circuit. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to probe the input to the um, the capacitor. So five volts essentially, or four four point two volts. Four point two volts get sent from the um, to charge the capacitor, but by the time it's been through the diode and resistor, it's actually only at three point four volts. So what I might do is actually reduce the value of this. Um, 10k resistor to maybe like a 1 or 2k resistor uh, and that'll get the capacitor charged up quicker and charged up to the full 4.2 volts. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to, I don't think it makes a difference because you know we've got exactly the operation that we want but in future if I was doing it again on this exact amplifier I would change that 10k for a lower value. Yeah no I, d I don't need to change it at all actually it's perfect. Yeah it works flawlessly that's exactly what I want. <coughs> So yeah, that's that. Uh, hopefully that made sense. Um, guys, tell me some questions. Do you have some questions about that? Do you want me to uh, explain anything again or differently? <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thanks for that. Just a little mod that I figured out a couple of weeks ago. I was bored of seeing these amplifiers power up instantly. This is an absolute nightmare. What do you think of a sound digital 400.2 amp running a set of components at 4 ohm instead of a class AB amp? So class D uh, mid-range amplifiers generally are quite noisy. There's generally, if well, most car amplifiers are pretty low quality anyway. You'll know that if you watch my video about uh, uh, cheap amplifiers killing subs that I responded to um, the guy from EMF Audio. I explained there the car audio amplifiers are some of the worst designed electronics on the market when compared to PA amplifiers, home cinema, home hi-fi amplifiers, Bluetooth, even Bluetooth speakers are like generally better designed than car amplifier circuits. So wait, a class D full range amplifier circuit will pretty much have a high noise floor. So with tweeters, it'll get, you'll get when there's no music playing. Um, and generally they won't have as much channel separation as a nicely designed class AB amplifier. Um, the, the sound won't, it won't be as sweet. Um, some people say that it sounds a bit harsh. Um, really, unless you've got super high-end speakers that are positioned and time-aligned correctly, it may be difficult to notice the difference to an average listener. So, or to be honest, if you just want some loud mid-range and door speakers to keep up with your 150 dBs in the back, 
Class D full range is absolutely fine. For me, I am definitely become a bit, I'm becoming a bit of an SQ fairy. So Class D full range for me, I notice the difference and I, I don't like how it sounds. There are some Class D full range amplifiers that do sound almost as good as or if not indistinguishable to a good quality Class AB amplifier. But you will not find those in the car audio market, my friend. You will find those more in the PA or Hi-Fi kind of uh, realm where there's a lot more money to be thrown around in terms of R&D on that stuff. Arnold says this happens because the resistor drains the capacitor. Yeah, exactly. So all we're doing is we're just charging a capacitor with about five volts and then we're discharging the capacitor. And while the capacitor is discharging, the TL494 chip on pin four is listening to the discharge. So the TL494 chip on pin four is listening to the voltage going from five, four, three, two, one, and therefore it reacts and changes the output as a result of the voltage that it listens. Dan, Dan, thanks for the five. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. There's, there's many feces have been, um, many feces have been emitting from that man's uh, mouth for a while on the, some recent videos. <laughs> Jokes. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. Appreciate the kind words there, buddy. The diode takes 0.6 volts. I might do actually. Hey, you know what? I could check that. So we could see where we're losing a little bit of voltage there from the um, from the supply of the 5 volts. Let's uh, let's have a look. So let's see. So we, we, we feed it with 4. It, it comes in at 4.2 volts there to start with. So it comes in at 4.2. After the diode, we have 3.8. Okay, yeah. So the diode does eat up a, a little bit of voltage there. It's a uh, 4148. It's probably not the exact correct diode to use here. Um, and just after the resistor, we've got 3.4. So yeah, starts off at 4.2. After the diode, 3.8. After the resistor, 3.4. So yeah, we lose 0.8 of a volt uh, through the diode and the resistor. But it's the the voltage at 3.4 volts is still high enough to. Uh, to apply 100% dead time to start with until it starts sinking down uh, and increasing the uh, increasing the duty cycle. Is this an audio pipe amp? Pretty much. Um, this circuit is used by hundreds of brands, including audio pipe. Audio pipe use these uh, boards, these circuit, these very similar circuit designs all the time. You recognise it quite quite well, probably. If I shoot the camera up there. Yeah, you'll probably recognise that circuit from a few times. A few different amplifiers. Akib says, I have amplifier circuits if you want. Uh, do you mean schematics? Yeah, schematics are always useful. I'm, I don't tend to use them particularly often. Um, only very rarely if I need a specific part number that's like burnt away or something that I don't already know what it is. So interestingly, a 5 volt Zener would be ideal. You're probably right, yeah. I haven't tried anything else other than the uh, 4148 just because it's what I had on hand when I did this first and it seemed to work okay. Um, but an interesting point about this. So the reason that these amplifiers have this design flaw in the first place. So this circuit here, this base phase DB1.3, this is on its fourth circuit revision now okay so this amplifier they had vision uh, version one revision one then revision two revision three and revision four so revision one and two didn't have any pull down resistors on the main rail capacitors now remember the whole problem with how this amplifier turns on is that the ad capacitors are always empty to start with. So when the amplifier turns on with a full duty cycle straight away, it's stressful for the power supply capacitors because it's trying to charge these capacitors from zero to 100 instantly. That's the problem. But the reason that the circuit was designed like this to go from zero to 100 instantly was because the version one and two of this circuit design didn't have pull down resistors on the rail capacitors. So the rail capacitors would never completely empty, which means that you don't really need this gradually increasing dead time on the power supply fetch because the capacitors are already charged to some extent or usually already full. 
So they are then presenting a high resistance to the power supply circuit instead of a low resistance when they're empty. So you don't need in that situation the power supply to turn on softly. It can just go from zero to 100 straight away because uh, the, you know it's got a high resistance on the output of the power supply. So that made sense. The, this circuit design worked better before they applied pull down resistors to the power, to the uh, rail capacitors here and when they applied the uh, the pull down resistors they didn't stop to think oh hang on a minute maybe we should add a soft start to the power supply section now that we've added pull down resistors because now every time the amplifier powers up the power supply is going to be presented with a short circuit for a brief moment until the capacitors charge they didn't think that so that's why we have this problem with the v3 and v3 v3 and v4 boards can you show pull down resistors? Yeah, the pull down resistors for the rail capacitors are these bad boys. This one here and this one here, these big ones here. So they are sitting across the capacitors plus and minus so that when the amplifier is turned off, they slowly dissipate the uh, voltage in these capacitors to ground. And that's actually, that should, that should be, you know, they all amplifiers should have that because otherwise you can turn this amplifier off, put it in your cupboard for a year and a year later, the capacitors have still got like 150 volts potential difference across them or even 200 volts potential difference across them. So then if you take the amplifier apart, you know, or if you give it to someone else and he takes it apart for whatever reason, do some cleaning or new thermal paste, he might get a nasty shock, you know, and the amplifier might die because of shorting out and stuff. So you need pull down resistors or capacitor discharge resistors. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, hopefully that's been uh, interesting, and I hope you learned something with that one. Um, a little shorter live stream this evening because uh, last night was crazy at four hours, and uh, this evening th this is the kind of length of the of the um, streamless or the vlogmas live streams are going to be. They're going to be between an hour uh, to two hours maximum, um, and we're going to be like just looking at one amplifier or just do covering some kind of uh, tips and stuff on here. Um, yeah. IRS 2092, what is THD versus watts? Data sheet, missed graphs, hang on a minute, what? What is THD versus watts? Data sheet, missed graphs, data like in TI data sheets. Uh, I haven't looked at the graphs that easy, but uh, do you mean that there's a graph that shows THD versus watts uh, output? I haven't looked at the data sheet for the TL, TL uh, 2092 in that much detail. I've only ever looked at this data sheet just to confirm which pins are the um, the gate output, for example, or which pin is the uh, high and low side input, if it even has that. Thanks for the kind words, buddy. Old school car audio. Massively appreciate it, dude. That's really nice of you. Thank you. There will be a test on Friday. <laughs> yeah, no. No, there, there won't be a test. <laughs> but yeah, so guys, I'll be back tomorrow with more shenanigans. Tomorrow will be a repair rather than a modification. Uh, what am I going to be looking at tomorrow? Try and think of something to do tomorrow. Maybe maybe a um, Zenon full bridge 10K amplifier to repair. That's something I need to do. Um, could be looking at a couple of Hertz HD1P. HP1D. Can't remember the model number. It's like a Hertz 2000 watt mono block amplifier that's quite nicely designed. I've got a couple of those to look at, which we could do for you. Um, also got a nice old school cadence amplifier that we could look at. Um, got an old power acoustic. Hey, check this bad boy out. I think this is, I think this could be pretty old school. What's this? This is, this is a old power acoustic USA. Like, does anyone recognize that? I, I've never seen this before. Um, but apparently it has no sound, no power, and you just get this little red LED on the board here. So we're going to be checking out. That should be a relatively simple fix, but it could be cool to showcase that. What's the chances we can get another repair now? Uh, not now, unfortunately. I actually need to head out now. It's midnight, but I need to head out. Um, i got some stuff to do just now. Uh, and But we'll be back tomorrow with uh, a full repair. Uh, it should be pretty fun. should be a pretty fun one tomorrow.
Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining me guys. Hopefully you learned something with this. Hopefully it expanded your knowledge even if you're not going to use this exact modification uh, in your day-to-day -day life. But pretty cool to know. And uh, yeah, guess I'll see you guys tomorrow.